Hello everybody! It's been a little while since I last talked about what I have made, but it's time for another crafting segment on this channel. In July, I worked pretty much monogamously on one thing, and I didn't really feel like filming a video about just that one thing, so I waited until after August because I completed some really big projects in August that I'm very proud of. So today I have a ton of things to show you guys. So as usual, I'm going to talk about finished objects first, then works in progress. I also have some natural dyeing experiments to share, and then probably some ideas of what I'm going to start working on next. So let's get into it. A little bit unusual for me, but I'm going to start with the sewing items that I completed first. I have two of them, and I'm very proud of both of them. The first one I made is a skirt, and I'm currently wearing it, so I'm not even sure if I can show it to you, but you know, it's a skirt. It's black. <laughs> It has pockets. Um, it is a new look pattern, probably from the 80s or 90s. It's from my mom's pattern collection. Um, I wasn't planning on making this black linen skirt. I bought this fabric for a different project entirely, but when I got it home and I washed it, I realized it was way more sheer than I thought it was. It was not gonna work for my original idea. So I turned it into a skirt instead, and I love it. Turns out I really did need a new lightweight black summer skirt in my wardrobe. I really love wearing this. So that's what I have, and I'm sorry I can't really show it to you, but it's, it's very big and floofy. <laughs> Also, it has pockets, which is really nice. Um, the one thing about making the skirt that I did really differently from what the pattern said is I didn't make up my mind on how to finish the seams on the inside until after I had sewn all the big pieces together. I thought I was going to serge the seam allowances because that's what the pattern says, but they would have been too thick and bulky for how lightweight this fabric is, so I ended up hand felling all of the seams which sounds like it was a real chore, but I did it in one day and it was really fun to do. So apparently I've turned into that person who really enjoys hand sewing. Like the parts of sewing projects I have always enjoyed the most have been when I can just do something by hand. I never thought I would say that. This is a revelation to me. In retrospect though, I should have sewed this particular skirt with French seams and saved myself a lot of time, but I didn't think to do that. <laughs> It came out just fine though. My other big sewing project that I completed in August is a pair of pants, which I can show you because I'm not wearing them right now. Um, these are the Lander pants from True Bias. I made the full length version, they're very long. Um, and this was kind of a whale of a project. Like, I was pursuing making this for quite a while. Over a year ago, I decided for some reason that I really, really wanted a pair of dark green corduroy high-waisted trousers with like a boot-cut leg. This is very specific. I never did find a dark green corduroy that I liked, but when I was at Joann's one day, I stumbled across this like deep plum fabric, which is, it's probably like a 21 whale corduroy, and I loved it, so I bought it, and then I picked a pattern. I had just enough fabric, and I love it. I think it came out really, really well. This is not absolutely complete. I need to move the top button on the waistband. I need to move it over like half an inch so that it will cinch in the waistband a tiny bit more. And I have a pocket. You could probably see that light patch in there. That's where the um, internal lining of the pocket is peeking through. And I, my mom said I should like rip out the edge stitching and stitch it again, but I'm too lazy to do that. I'll probably just get in with a needle and try to tack down the edge a little bit to hide that um, because the fabric on the inside is a little bit light and so it really shows up um, against that dark purple color. So I love these. This, this was one of those projects that just shows me how much I have actually learned about sewing. <laughs> like I thought I would be absolutely overwhelmed making these pants. And it took a week, a week and like two solid days out of my weekend to make it, but I was never stuck. I never 
really didn't understand what I was supposed to be doing. Um, the most challenging thing about doing this was working with the fabric because it's a pretty stiff corduroy and I'd, I'd always worked with relatively lightweight fabrics in the past and there was a point where I was like trying to gently get my sewing machine needle through like six layers of fabric. <laughs> oh my, but it came out very nicely. I can't wait to wear them. It's way too hot to wear these pants right now, but um, once I fix that button and tack down the um, pocket a little bit better, it'll be ready to go. And I have hopes I'll be able to wear them pretty soon because we're getting some cooler days now. It's beginning to feel a little bit like autumn. Now let's talk shawls. I finished one shawl in July and then I did a surprise one in August and I love both of them. This first one was a work in progress last time I talked to you about what I was making and it is now complete. This is my hedge maze shawl. It is a pattern from Julia Decker, who is Dune and Knits on Ravelry. And it is this beautiful, beautiful brioche design. This is one of the most perfect things I have ever made. <laughs> I am proud of myself, but also just kind of in, in awe. It was a beautiful, well-written pattern that I should do more than once. Like some patterns are just so good. I think they deserve to be done more than once. Um, and the yarn that I, I used for this was also a perfect choice. I really love the contrast and colors I have here. Um, kind of have this um, light brownish gray color on top of the dark purple. You can see that purple color a little bit more on the back side here. Um, just really high contrast is good for brioche and it really makes that design pop. The yarn is Treasure Goddess Yak Toes, I think. It is a sock yarn with um, yak in addition to the merino and nylon. It's really luxurious, it's very warm. It's got this beautiful drape to it as well. I loved it, I loved knitting with it. If I had all the money in the world, I would just buy massive sweater quantities of this yarn. It's really, really beautiful. So yeah, it's another piece that I cannot wait to wear once it is a little bit cooler. It's just the perfect shawl to put on in the morning when it's a bit nippy out. And it's, it's big enough too. Like this is the kind of shawl shape that I really like, the big like half circle that's quite deep as well. So it go, goes on over the shoulders. I prefer to wear my shawls like this. I know a lot of people like wrap them up around their neck and I, that's not how I always love wearing them. So. It's super, super beautiful. <laughs> I could just go on and on about this, but it is so great. And I will have to try more of Julia Decker's patterns because I think her brioche designs are really kind of different and really elegant and beautiful. And you know how much I enjoy knitting brioche. The other shawl that I cast on and did in the month of August was a surprise one. Last time I talked to you, I showed you the Graceling collection of yarn colorways from Third Vault Yarns. Lola did four colorways that are inspired by the four Graceling books by Kristen Kishore, and I loved the colors, so I bought the yarn and was determined to use them in a like a gradient project together, and I just couldn't pick a pattern. I was really stuck. And then in early August, uh, Tiff Nealon released a new shawl pattern that was perfect. So I cast it on right away and I have a big, big, beautiful gradient triangular shawl with tassels. <laughs> This was so fun to knit. Um, it is mostly those Graceling colors, which is the green, the variegated blue, the heavily variegated purple, and then this um, orangey pink color. I threw in a couple of other colors to help with the transitions and having enough yardage. So at the very end here we have a white, which is just a Sandnaskarn colorway, um, then the kind of speckled a uh, white color is Koi, that is also a Third Vault Yarns colorway. Um, a green in here was the remainder of the kind of uh, grayish green color Cosmic Turtle, also Third Vault Yarns. Um, I used up the last of the solid blue color um, from the tank top I made earlier this year. There's a solid purple colorway in here as well. You can see it pretty well in this section. In there and that was just a one-off semi-solid purple color I got from Chemnitz last year 
and yeah it's so beautiful i think i think my gauge was really different from the pattern i never do gauge swatches for shawls <laughs> i just went with the needle size recommended because it gave me a fabric that i really liked i tried to knit it with like going down a needle size and it felt too stiff um so it's bigger and i used a lot more yardage than the pattern calls for but it wasn't like i was gonna run out of yarn it's so, so cool, and I just love the tassels as well. I did three, one for each of the points of the triangle. This was just a fun in terms of color play. The pattern is um, the artist's garden party shawl blanket, I think. The point of it is just to have fun with colors and texture. It's written for a minimum of two colors, but you can change the colors and swap them around as much as you want. There are some good transition points with these eyelet sections, um, where, which is where I did most of my color changes. Though you can see the one color change where I forgot what I was doing and I just didn't do a good gradient. Um, and the texture is really cool. There are a lot of slip stitch textures, some things that are almost like brioche, a garter stitch section, which is kind of modified. Um, I just, it was really fun and it mixes together the colors in a really neat way. My favorite color combination is here at the end. You can see this section down here, which is, I think it's um, unfathomable depths mixed with crown of flame. So it's like a, variegated purple and blue section mixed with a lot of the orange and pink. I didn't think it was going to be a really good combination and then I knit it and was like, I need to do an entire project mixing these two colors together. So it's big, it's squishy, it's warm, can't wait to wear it once again when it gets a little bit cooler. My next finished object is a garment and that is this tee, which I will put on so you can see it a little bit better. This is the Ginkka Fight Tee by Emily Green. It's from a back issue of Pom Pom Quarterly, and it's this like stylized ginkgo leaf design, um, just done with like kind of a, a lace pattern. It's really cool. The color of the yarn is not showing through very well. It's like totally blowing out, but it is um, a John Arbin Textiles yarn called Another Friday Night. It's a special colorway on their Yarnadelic base. And in person, it is actually a kind of deep petrol blue. It's kind of heathered, but it's mostly a very dark blue with some gray um, tones to it as well. I love this color so much. This yarn was so lovely to work with. A little bit splitty, but it's a beautiful color. I don't remember if it has silk in it or not. Maybe it's BFL, but it has a little bit of a sheen to it as well. So it's just really gorgeous. My favorite part of this is actually the sleeves. <laughs> There's a little bit of some shaping on the sleeve caps and then this folded edge. There's also a folded neckband, which is done in a pretty interesting way. So yeah, um, an interesting project that I've been planning to make for a really long time. And when I actually sat down to do it, I didn't enjoy making most of it. It was a little bit boring to knit because the front and the back are absolutely the same. So it was very repetitive, but I really enjoyed the finishing details when I like, I seamed it because it's knit in pieces and then doing the sleeves and the neck band were really fun. Okay, the color is showing a little bit better now. This is closer to what it actually looks like in person. Um, so yeah, that's the Ginkka Fight Tea, one that I've been planning on making for a long time and I finally, finally knit all of it in August and I'm really happy with it. I think it will be perfect to wear in the spring and in the autumn when it's a little bit chilly, but you can wear short sleeves and just have, you know, the nice warm wool. I will say that this yarn is not the softest. As much as I really love it, it's it's really kind of an in-between for like kind of rustic-y, but also not super harsh, I guess. I would say like, I think it's a tiny bit prickly to wear directly against the skin, but just touching it like with my hands, it's it's not super rough or anything. And I do prefer some more rustic-y wooly wool, so I like it, it doesn't really bother me, but I think for the most part I would wear it with an undershirt to keep it from being like directly against my skin all the time. And that is not all, I have one more thing to show you. Um, I felt after making so many big projects, I should try to make some small things just like 
dopamine nits, like that instant gratification of making something small that you can do really quickly and then you're, you're done, you know? So um, I recently got the Moon and Turtle collection by Sachiko and uh, Kiyomi Bergen. It's put out by Pom Pom Press and there's a hat pattern in it that I had just enough yardage to make. So I made basically a matching hat for the Skin Can Fight tee. The outside color is that same um, Yarnadelic yarn from John Arbin textiles and the inside of the hat is a really fuzzy mohair. This is the last of the Knit Picks Aloft in the color Carbon that I had used for my bindweed cardigan which I showed you guys last time. I'm actually going to put this hat on. Uh, you may not know this but I don't wear hats. I think I look terrible in hats. <laughs> But I think it's kind of hard to see what, what a hat looks like unless you're actually wearing it. So we're going to put this on. And I'm going to try to not feel too stupid in public with it on. Um, so that's the hat. It's supposed to be the slouchy beanie version, but I think my fabric is kind of stiff. So it doesn't slouch very much in the back. I could have probably have just done the shorter version and it would have been fine. Um, so yeah, but it'll definitely keep my ears warm. It's, it's, you know, it's a double thickness and then when you flip the brim up, it's quadruple thickness. So I like it a lot. It was really fun to knit and it's a hat that I will actually wear, even though I feel stupid wearing hats. <laughs> Did I mention what this was called? This is the Poka Poka hat. <laughs> and it was really fun to knit. It's basically like, 20 inches of stockinette in the round. Um, you do a provisional cast on, you knit it up, you knit the hat, you do the, the crown of the hat, and then you turn it back over, you pick up stitches from the provisional cast on, and you knit another hat, and then you put one side into the other. I would show you, but I actually have my internal a uh, bit attached at the crown so I can't pull it out to show you, but it kind of gives you this really big elongated egg shape. <laughs> It's pretty fun. It was very easy to knit, very relaxing, and one of those instant gratification projects. I'll probably make another one. It's, it's also a good stash buster because it doesn't take that much yarn. I might do a stripey version to mix some leftovers that I have. Um, will I wear more than one of these? Probably not, but they make good gifts. Hats always make a good gifts. If you live in an area of the world where you have like real proper winter, I guess. So that is it. That is my polka polka hat. Very, very fun. Those are all of my finished projects and I'm now gonna go take a break and walk my dog. And then when I get back, I'll probably show you my works in progress. But if my outfit changes, it's because it's a different day. I just played hooky for the rest of the day. <laughs> One hot and sweaty dog walk later, let's talk about works in progress. First, let's do a quick check-in on my Handsome Chris pullover. This is the recreation of the famous sweater from Knives Out that Chris Evans' character wears. Um, last time I showed this to you, my marker's on the back here, I was here, so I've worked a good five inches, and as you may sort of be able to see, I have a split for the sleeves, and I'm now working on the front, and then I'll go back and do the back, and I'm probably going to experiment with um, doing short rows for the shoulder shaping rather than binding off stitches. I will bind off for the neckline shaping, but I really would prefer to do a three needle bind off for the shoulder seam rather than sewing bound off edges together. I just I don't mind seaming garments now, especially if I am um, using mattress stitch like on the side of a garment, but seaming shoulders, I do not like doing that. So I'm going to attempt to do a three needle bite off and I should probably stop hitting myself in the face with sharp needles. So that is that. It is getting quite heavy. And this is the point in the project where I remember that one of the major benefits of knitting a sweater in pieces is that you aren't carrying around the weight of the entire garment the whole time you're knitting it. It's just a little bit easier to manage. Um, I will be knitting the sleeves separately and then sewing them in because I want to knit them from the cuff up uh, to match how I'm doing the cables on the body. Um, so that that will be a good a break from the heavy knitting <laughs> of the body. So that's it for the Handsome Chris pullover. If I continue at this rate, I'll finish the body in September 
cross fingers and then do the sleeves and the final seaming in October. My goal is to have this sweater done and wearable by Thanksgiving, so around um, late November, when it should probably be cool enough to wear woolly sweaters. The other garment that I'm currently working on, there's not much to see and it's black, so it's a little bit difficult to show on camera. I'm sure this is going to blow out the colors terribly. Um, but this is a black cardigan. Um, the pattern I'm using is called Kalamata. I can't remember the designer's name off the top of my head, but the information will be down below in the description. This is just a basic cardigan with raglan style shaping and it's going to have a pretty thick shawl collar like um, band around it and that's what I'm making this for. I wanted something simple with a shawl collar that I could modify if I wanted and I wanted it to be black. <laughs> this is also acrylic yarn. Um, it is Big Twist Soft in just a plain black color. This is like a worsted or Aran weight yarn. And I'm doing this because um, I just desperately need a washable black cardigan with that nice cozy shawl collar. I have a store-bought one that is falling to pieces. I have had to repair the seams on that so many times. I'm a bit tired of it. So this will be the replacement for that. Not much to say about it. The pattern is very simple and straightforward and um, it's a lot of plain knitting. Um, obviously it's knit flat because it's a cardigan and I'm not steaking it or anything. So it's, it's good TV knitting, just back and forth, back and forth for another at least 14 inches. <laughs> And the last work in progress I have to show you is just like an inch and a half of twisted rib on a circular needle. Um, this is the very, very beginning of the Wildflowers shawl from uh, 52 Weeks of Shawls. I, I'm blanking on the designer's name, but once again, all that will be down below in the description. I don't have the physical book to show you, otherwise I would show you the pattern, but the book is on loan to friends right now. Uh, but it begins with Twisted Rib, and I have set up after an increase round to actually start working from the chart. And uh, I think this is a really beautiful shawl. It's got this, like, I guess like single twisted cable uh, flower pattern on it. It's really interesting. I think it might also have like some baubles or nups and stuff for the texture. Um, and it's going to have a fringe, but what has really intrigued me about doing this is that it is steaked. Obviously it's a shawl and a pretty long one, but you work it in the round, so that's nice. Um, so I think it will be a nice first introduction to steaking and learning a little bit about how to make a fringe. I'm using this big cone of yarn held double. This is Holstgarn Super Soft. Um, it is very thin looking, though it does bloom considerably with blocking. I am holding um, it double stranded to get gauge, and I think it's gonna work out really well for this. I've seen a couple of other people who have used this yarn held double to make this particular shawl, and it seems to work really well. Um, and otherwise, it's kind of uh, parked right now because I need to use my size 5 needles on this, but my size 5 needles are currently in my Handsome Chris Pullover project, so yeah. <laughs> also, they're both very gray. I'm still on a bit of a gray kick, though I will show you some different colored yarn in a second. That is it for my works in progress, so now let me show you the very exciting results of my natural dyeing experiments in August. I am amazed at the results of these. Um, so basically I wanted to try some solar dyeing techniques, you know it's been very sunny and very hot, and I have some half gallon jars, so let's go do this. The first thing that I tried was dyeing with Red Hopi Dye Amaranth. Red Amaranth is the most intensely colored amaranth available. The, I think it's specifically the, the Hopi Dye version. And I grew a bunch of it in my flower garden this year, specifically, I mean, it's very, very attractive looking, uh, but also because I wanted to try doing a, a dye experiment with it. And uh, so I found a popular blog post about how to dye with it with a solar dyeing technique, which basically said put all of the flower bracts and the um, leaves in a jar in the sun for like a week. 
So I did that and it was intensely colored, like this cherry red liquid. It was stunning and it smelled like death after six days in the sun. It was horrible. I didn't throw it out though. I was like, I'm committed. I strained it, held my nose, and then I put um, my fiber in it just to see what would happen. And the, the results I seen from this blog post I was following were like this cherry red color, almost like this deep pink. And I have no idea how anyone gets that color. Um, my dye bath made my wool like electric purple at first. I wish that I had taken better pictures uh, because it was pretty stunning. I let it sit uh, like the fiber in the pot in the sun for another like six hours and when I came back it looked dark blue. <laughs> it is this kind of a dusty gray blue color. A ton of the color came out when I washed it but it just stayed blue and for the life of me I have no idea how I got a, a real blue color from red amaranth. I've done some digging around to see how other people have experimented with red amaranth and everything I've seen from other people has been beiges, tans, sometimes a kind of muted coral color, but no hot pinks, no reds, and certainly no blues. So I'm completely stumped. I don't know if it was the pH of my dye bath. Um, I don't know if the dye bath had basically fermented when it was sitting in the sun for six days. Um, and for some reason, the dye um, didn't completely um, evenly cover it. There are some sections that are pale and kind of a grayish yellow color, though most of it is blue. So yeah, um, I'm also glad that once it dried, like I washed it and dried it, it didn't smell like death anymore. Yeah, it doesn't smell like anything right now, but once it had dried, it's just smelled slightly organic, but it is one of the nastiest things I had ever smelled before. I don't think I will ever do that sort of intense solar dyeing experiment with amaranth again. But next year when I have fresh um, amaranth, I will probably do some pH experiments because I did see some people say that making it more um, base or acidic could really shift the color towards, you know, more, I don't know, yellow or pink or something. So I think it's worth experimenting with again, and it'll be very interesting if I ever end up with a blue. After that, I decided to try a solar dye technique with black-eyed Susan flowers. These are really beautiful um, yellow flowers. And I grew some and my mom grew some, so we had a, a lot of these flower heads. So I did pretty much the same thing. Um, I had two half-gallon jars that I filled with water and I filled them about halfway with just like the, the whole flower heads. I just snipped them off and put them in there. I measured it and I had uh, a little bit more weight of dye stuff to fiber that I was going to put in so it was going to be a, a, a nice color. And so I didn't really look this up beforehand. I was following instructions for dyeing with flowers from Harvesting Color by Rebecca Burgess, which is uh, a, a dye book that I refer to a lot. It has really good instructions in it. But what I didn't realize when I started this is that um, Black Eyed Susans don't necessarily give you a yellow. I assumed it was going to be yellow because that's what I'd seen all sorts of other flowers give. But no. <laughs> so what I had originally set this experiment up to be was one like control, just put the fiber in there and see what color it was. And then the other one, which is exactly the same, I was going to add a copper solution to. And copper plus yellow from other flowers I've seen can make a green color. So that's what I was after. But as it turns out, Black Eyed Susans on their own will give a kind of greenish color, not necessarily yellow, but more like a pale teal. This is what I got. It is for the most part like a very pale teal or a pale sage green color with some splotches of a more grass green. I don't know where that variation came from. There was a lot of resist in the glass jar and I didn't 
um, push the fiber in and move it around a lot like I would if I was using a dye vat on the stove. So I really just sort of jammed it in there and then just left it overnight. Um, but I think the color is beautiful and even the uh, silk swatch is nice. There are some dark patches on my silk swatches. That's because I hung them up on iron hooks. I won't be doing that in the future, but you know, iron <laughs> makes dark colors. Um, so I was pretty stunned when I pulled it out and it was sage green. Now the other pot or jar that I put the copper into came out green, like bright grass green. Once again, there's a lot of variegation in it because of that resist and how I didn't move it around a lot. So the dye penetration is really uneven. Uh, but this is for the most part a definite bright grassy green color. You can really see the difference when I hold up the sage green one. I am just flabbergasted. <laughs> I'll be very curious to see um, how these colors last. Um, I didn't have any bleeding whatsoever when I washed them, um, so I think just letting them sit in that dye bath in the heat for at least 24 hours um, is all that it really takes. And get it a bit warm and heat set it. And of course I am working with uh, mordanted fiber. And then the really stunning experiment. Um, so when I was looking through the Harvesting Color book by Rebecca Burgess, she gives this recipe for dyeing with pokeberry. Pokeberry is a weed in much of the United States, I think in much of North America. It grows everywhere around here, um, including in the back of my house. <laughs> But it is a wild berry that is not edible. It's a good source of food for like birds, but it is toxic to humans. But apparently people have been trying to figure out how to get the color from poke berries to stay. I believe that a lot of berries are more like fugitive dyes. Um, you might get some color, but it will fade rapidly. It's not um, wash fast, color fast, light fast. But there's one person who figured out a method to get the pokeberry color to stick, and it involves vinegar, a very, very acidic dye bath. I so wanted to try this because the color can be stunning. So it is now full on pokeberry season, and my mom and I went out to a local walking bike path, and we got um, like an entire gallon of pokeberries and I just used them immediately. They were so ripe, that they, they needed to be used. I think you can freeze them, but I wasn't ready to do that. So I did just one test with like the full intensity of the color and I got this. This is amazing. In some light, it looks very pink, and other lights, like probably on camera right now, you get this really, really deep um, berry red color. It's beautiful. Oh my god, this is my color right here. Um, so this is the full intensity of the color, which is about, I think, I think it's like the 25 to 1 ratio, so like 25 grams of berries to one gram of fiber. Um, so about as intense as you can get. And there was still so much color in the dye bath that the next day I reused it and put in a whole bunch of my remaining fiber to get a hot pink color. It's a little bit more um, electric looking on camera right now, but if I put them up together, you can see the difference in the color saturation. I was expecting to get a paler pink than this because I think if I just do some rough calculations in my head, this turned out to be closer to a 10 to one ratio, like 10 grams of berries to one gram um, of the fiber. So less than half of the intensity probably of the, the dark version. It's still a really beautiful color. I'm not a hot pink person, but I could find a use for this color. The thing with pokeberry, of course, is will the color stay? This highly acidic method where you use vinegar to mordant your fiber is very unusual, and I haven't seen many other people 
test how color fast or light fast this is. The woman who came up with the method says that it that it works and she has fiber that's lasted with the color for more than a decade. But with this, I think I may um, take some sections of both of these colors and do some experiments, um, keep some in sunlight to see how light fast it is, wash some of it with detergent multiple times to see if, if um, washing brings out the color, and just do some tests because if the color does stick, it would be absolutely worth it to use pokeberry for a large scale dye experiment. Like, if I can get this color to stick, I will dye up a sweater's quantity worth of it because it is absolutely my color. I am just super impressed. I have never seen a similar shade of red or hot pink from any other dye source except possibly cochineal, which I haven't dyed with before. Um, Matter is like a really traditional source of red, but it's a more muted orangey red or brownish red and not necessarily deep berry pinkish red, you know? So yeah, very, very successful natural dyeing experiments in August. I'm kind of riding on a high from this. <laughs> But as we go into um, the fall, a lot of the natural sources of uh, dye stuff isn't going to be available until next spring. So I will probably now experiment more with dye extracts that I have gotten from a verb for keeping warm. Oh, also black walnut. Very, very much want to explore that. That is pretty much it for me. I just want to mention quickly what I'm probably going to cast on next. I do want to make some socks, and there are two more sock patterns from Anushka at the Crimson Stitchery that I want to make, and I have like yarn set aside for them and everything, so I just need to do some more of those small instant gratification projects, and socks are always great. <laughs> I will wear them, but uh, my next big project that I will probably Probably start is going to be with this really really beautiful dark green yarn. Knit Picks had a big summer sale and I used that as my excuse to get um, a bunch of mohair and some of their stroll sock yarn for this next project. So this stroll um, is the color... oh wait does it even say? I think it's like Aurora is the color. Oh, Aurora Heather. And then the mohair silk, this is their Aloft yarn, which I've used multiple times now. And this is the color Labyrinth, which is, oh, this is the kind of green color I adore. I'm going to put these two together to make one of Augustine's patterns, probably Augustine's number one, because texture ruffles peplum. It's a very feminine design. It's probably more feminine than what I typically wear, um, but I'm thinking of mashing it up with, I think it's Augustine's number 14, which has a really cool like puffy lace detail on the sleeves, and I love that lace, but I kind of want to put it on the style and the fit of the Augustine's number one garment. So dark green, and a fall project, it's probably gonna end up being a Christmas sweater. <laughs> but I think it'll be a really fun and pretty fast knit because it's gonna be done on huge needles. So with that, I think we've reached the end of my crafting rambles. Let me know what you are currently working on. Thank you so much for watching and I will talk to you again soon. And until then, bye.